Okay, let's dive right into this. So go back and watch part one, all right, to catch up so I don't have to regurgitate. And if you ask certain questions and I covered it already in part one, go back there. That's fundamental. It's basics. It helps you to prepare you for today, okay? So if you're here today and you haven't watched part one, stick around, learn, but understand when you go back to part one, it's going to make part two much more clear for you. Is that understood? Okay? Loud and clear. I see you. Okay, so I want to teach you a couple things about hearing the voice of God. One of the most crucial things when it comes to hearing the voice of God is understanding the ways God speaks. Okay, I covered this a little bit in part one, but I want to touch on this so we can move forward. To understand how God speaks, you have to understand that there's multiple ways that God speaks. God speaks through multiple different ways. Here's some ways God speaks. He speaks through scripture, through prayer, through dreams, visions, prophetic words, through nature, through circumstance, coincidences, consciousness. He speaks through sermons and teachings and worship and miracles and intuition and inspiration. He speaks through people. He speaks through symbols and signs and peace and supernatural. He speaks through wisdom and insight. He speaks through divine impressions, songs, music, and personal convictions. These are different ways, okay? So I'm gonna go down through these and I'm gonna break them down. I shared a little bit of this yesterday when we did part one, but I wanna actually break it down a little bit more in detail and kind of show you what this looks like, okay? So I want you to turn with me, first of all, to 2 Timothy. Turn with me to 2 Timothy, okay? We're gonna go to 2 Timothy. 3 16 and 17 i want to teach you how you've always been hearing the voice of god okay second timothy 3 we're going to go to chapter 3 verses 16 through 17. it says this all scripture everybody say all scripture type all scripture in the comments okay all scripture all scripture it says here all scripture is given by inspiration everybody type inspiration in the comments this is critical I want you to circle this word inspiration this is probably one of the most underlooked and overvalued concepts of hearing God that is rarely talked about today that's going to be a revelation for you today type revelation in the comments Yes, this is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says all scripture. That means everything to do with scripture. All of scripture, the written word. Okay. All of the written word, all of scripture is given by inspiration. Test question. Test question from what we just read in the one sentence we read. All scripture comes through what? Type in the comments. All scripture comes through what? All scripture comes through what? All scripture is given by inspiration, right? Now process for a second. What is that saying? That's saying that the word of God, which I hope you guys believe, maybe the way I do, I, I, I'm assuming you do, that the word of God is inspired word. It's the inspired word of God. It's inspired by God and by inspiration. Okay, it's inspired. So, so, so I want you to think about this for a second. Scripture is the word of God. The word of God has been inspired. The inspiration is the word of God. I hope you understand what I'm saying right now. What is this verse telling us? It's telling us that the word of God, the written word is inspired. Listen to me real quick. I know I'm repeating myself. I know I'm a broken uh, record right now. But if you don't get what I'm saying, you're going to miss this thing, okay? This is telling us that the Word of God comes through inspiration. This is telling us to be able to hear God's voice, we have to pay attention to what inspires us. We have to pay attention to what inspires us. Now, many people teach that you shouldn't trust those things. They will teach you to orphanize those things, to even reject those things. 
But I'm here to tell you, if you don't trust your inspiration as the voice of God, you will miss God. Let me prove it to you. The authors of the Bible were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write scripture. That means if they would not have moved on their inspiration to write it down, we would not have scripture today. We would not have the word of God today. It's important that you understand that the word of God comes through your inspiration, just like all of scripture, all of the word. Do you understand what I'm saying here? That means that in everything to do with the word of God, all of scripture, all of the written word, all of the rhema, all of the logos, everything concerning the word comes through inspiration. Type inspiration in the comments, okay? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Everybody say profitable. Do you understand what profit is? Do you understand the concept of profit? When you're in business, you're in business to make a profit. That means that you are gonna come away with more than just get by. If you're just in business to get by, you're not gonna be in business long. Because if you're just breaking even, that means you do not have enough. If you're just getting by, that means you are struggling. Okay, now I want you to shift that carnal concept to the living word of God. If we're only trusting our inspirations to a certain level, but not fully diving into our inspirations, you're just gonna get enough to get by. And if you're satisfied with just enough to get by, you're always going to be struggling all of your life to hear the voice of God. Are you following me? So it is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. So the inspiration, the words of God are profitable for these three areas. For reproof, for, for doctrine, and for correction. It's also, Apostle Paul tells us, that prophecy, which we know prophecy, is a testimony. It's the word of Jesus. It's the testimony of Jesus. It's the story of Jesus. It's the life of Jesus. Meaning, prophecy is revelation. And revelation is a revealing. And the revealing is the person Jesus. Amen. So we understand that prophecy is the build up to edify and in to encourage. The edifying, the building up and the encouraging is profitable for doctrine, it's profitable, it's profitable for reproof and correction. Let me teach you something. A lot of people don't like the word correction or reproof. When it comes to doctrine, that can be a hot mess too. You know there's 40,000 different doctrines or let me say it like this. There's 40,000 different denominations with 30,000 different doctrines and every single one of them believe they're right and the others are wrong. Like you can get lost in the sauce if you don't have relationship with the word, okay? This is why it's so important that we learn to master the voice of God because if we know the voice of God, we're not gonna get lost in the sauce, we're gonna have confidence. We're gonna have revelation, we're gonna have understanding. Who's gonna have it? You. And until you have that intimate relationship with God, until you have that confidence with God, you will easily get twisted up in any wind of doctrine because you are unsettled in the word. But there's some important facts here that are being shared to us. If we don't understand the importance of the word and what the word is for, and we understand that the all scripture, all of the word, everything we read is an inspiration and it's been inspired. So the inspirations you have are literally the word of God, the voice of God speaking to you. Did you know that? 
Has anybody ever cared enough to help you understand that the inspiration you have right now in your life is the voice of God speaking to you. See, I'm not going to teach you how to hear the voice of God. I'm going to teach you how you've always been hearing it. And nobody's taught us that. And today, you're about to step into freedom. <clears throat> now listen. It's for correction and for instruction in righteousness. Now, when we talk about righteousness here, I just want to say this. The righteousness is talking about here is the finished work. Okay. We've turned that into behavior modification. And let me just say this. Behavior modification is important, by the way. But I want to say that righteousness isn't about behavior modification. Righteousness that gets turned into behavior modification can easily turn into manipulation. Did you just hear what I said? Righteousness that gets turned into behavior modification can easily be turned into manipulation. Religion. Now listen, it's not religion, it's not religious to change a habit, to stop living old dead man ways and start living new man. That's not religious. But to stop living in the old man reality and live out a righteous reality, you have to understand righteousness. Righteousness is the same as the word. The word is a person. His name is Jesus. Do you understand here? Let me reread this. And where it says righteousness, I'm going to put the name of Jesus. And you'll, you'll get it. You'll get the revelation. So all scripture is given an inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, and correction, and instruction in Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's for reproof, for correction, for direction, right? In righteousness, in Jesus. This is literally happening in Jesus. Do you follow what I'm saying? Does this make sense? I want this to connect with you guys, okay? So it's got to make sense here. It's got to connect because this has got to go over the top for you today, okay? Verse 17, that men of God, just type men of God in the comments because you have to understand the reference point in which it's speaking to, speaking to men of God. That means people who walk out this reality may be complete, thoroughly, equipped for every good work. So what is this telling us? To be able to be fully equipped for every good work, to thoroughly walk in the completeness of all scripture and the completeness of instruction and reproof and correction and doctrine, all men got to live by the inspiration of God, by the word of God, in the word of God. And if they live by the inspiration of Scripture and become inspired by Scripture because they understand that their inspiration is the Word of God speaking to them, not only are they going to be able to hear God through the Bible, Scripture, the written Word, but you're going to begin the process of learning how to hear God in the spirit of the Word. Not just, not just the Logos, but the Rhema. Because technically, everybody put technically in the comments, the Logos was birthed from the Rhema. Do you understand? This is a word was birthed. This word was birthed. Who was it birthed through? The Spirit. The Spirit inspired holy men of God, men of God like you and I, inspired to write it down. It was birthed here on earth. They written down the very inspirations of God so that we can learn how to live from our inspiration. That we too can learn to tap into our inspirations to flow in the word. Are you following me? Does this make sense? 
I want this to connect because I want to teach you how you've always been hearing the voice of God. And how do we do it? We do it through the word. So what does this look like, ladies and gentlemen? It looks like this. Follow me for a second, okay? It looks like this. When you read scripture, it's important to read scripture to see God's character. It's important to read scripture to go, know God's nature. Those things are very important. But it's equally important that when we read scripture, we pay very close attention to learn his voice so that we can understand how to, excuse me, download the inspirations of God that he's given us because his voice comes through the inspiration. Now, let me say this. What does this look like? How does this look? Well, let's look at Proverbs 37.4. Everybody type Proverbs 37.4 in the comments. In Proverbs 37.4, it says this, that God given you the desire of your heart. Follow me for a second. This is literally telling us that God has given us the desire of our heart. What does that mean? That means that the desire of your heart has been given by God. Do you understand that God only gives me and you his perfect will? Do you believe that? Do you believe that everything that God gives us, every gift from God that comes down from God, every good and perfect gift that comes down from God is his perfect will? Do you believe that? Okay, if you believe that, then you got to believe this. That God given you, listen, he's given you the desires of your heart. So if God has given you the desire of your heart, what is that saying? What does that inspire? What's that spark off in you? That's telling you this, that the desire of your heart is God's perfect will for your life. Are you following me? Now, the ones that will struggle with this are the ones who are still living by the old man mindset. The ones that are still attaching themselves to dead old man realities. The people who have not been convinced that the old man is dead. The individuals and people who still believe the theolo theological doctrine that the Holy Spirit has the old man on life support and trying to choke him out every single day of his life. Those individuals will struggle with believing this because they see the old man. Yeah, the old man's dead, but they almost look at the dead like him being on life support and like you're trying to choke him out every day. <laughs> Hear what I'm saying here, okay? The old man is dead to God. Now, I'll cover more of that in part one. You go back to part one and go through that. But you have to be convinced that the old man is really dead and it's not just dead, but it's dead to God. Until you realize it's dead to God, you're never going to accept the reality that it's dead. So as long as you haven't accepted that, you're going to still see yourself from dead old man realities. You're going to still identify yourself to dead old man realities. People today still, as Christians, as believers, identify their flesh as the old man. They still do that today. That's my flesh. When, they, when something goes wrong or something like that, that's my flesh. That was just my flesh. That's my carnal mind. Do you understand what you're doing? When you do that, do you understand what you're doing? You're literally cutting yourself off from the blessings of God. You're literally cutting yourself off with the blessings of God by saying that. Do you understand? The old man is dead. It's dead. The flesh against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh is an old dead man's reality. Are you following me? It's an old dead man's reality. I wish people would get this. People don't know spiritual things. They're still carnal. They don't know how to study the word of God right. They're ignorant. There's a lot of ignorance in the body. And, and listen, I don't say that to poke at people. I'm saying that because it's just we believe stupid stuff because we've been taught a stupid gospel. We haven't been taught the truth. And I'm here to tell you the truth. The old man is dead. Okay? The flesh against the spirit, spirit against the flesh is dead. When Apostle Paul was saying the things I don't want to do, I do, and the things I want to do, I don't do, right? Because of sin that's in me. Do you, people end right there. 
And they go, well, Apostle Paul obviously said there was, it was in him and he was recognizing his weakness and he was identifying himself to the very thing you're saying we're dead to, Paul B. And I'm like, can you please finish the verse? Can you please finish the verse in context? Please finish the verse in context, okay? When you read the verse in context, it says at the very end of that, I thank my God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who freed me. <laughs> Apostle Paul understood the struggle, but he understood he didn't identify himself to the struggle, to the dead old man. He identified himself to the freedom. Just because you're dead to it doesn't mean you don't have a habit or don't act in it. It just means that you can be convinced it's dead because God is convinced it's dead. <laughs> Are you following me? You have to get this revelation and you'll never hear God's voice correct. You'll always be a hot mess. As long as you're living out of this mindset that it's my carnal mind my flesh, and you're looking at flesh as a dead old man reality as the bad guy, the carnal mind is the bad guy. You're still identifying yourself to idols and you're an idol worship and you've set a knowledge above the knowledge of God and you're an idol worship and you need to repent and tear them idols down, the strongholds down. Are you following me? You, listen, listen. As long as you keep saying, that's my carnal mind. You're prophesying a dead reality. You will get dead results because you prophesy it. You're speaking from the spirit, but technically you're speaking, you don't know what spirit you're speaking of. So you're technically speaking from life, the spirit, the only source of life, which is God that gives life to all, all spirits, but you're speaking out of a wrong mindset. So you're prophesying this carnal mind. No, listen, you don't have, you're not identified to a carnal mind. You're identified to the mind of Christ. If you don't know who you are, you're going to get bewitched into any wind of doctrine. And you're going to twist scripture to, to fit the carnal realities to live out humanism gospel. The old man is dead, period. He's not on life support. You're not trying to choke him out. He's dead. Does that mean... Are you telling me that, Paulie B, that I, 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 like sin doesn't matter, that it's okay, I can sin, I can do anything since it's dead to God? No, for be it not. For be it not. The fact that you would think that still shares the state of mind you're in. That thought shouldn't even be in your mind, by the way. It shouldn't even be there. But since it's there, we got to deal with it. Because you are the mind of Christ. Dead old realities don't even pertain to you. The scripture says, deny yourself and follow Christ. That's talking about denying the old man. Denying any existence to do with the old man. That's not denying the skin on your bones. That's not to deny you the things you love in this world. It's not meant to, den it's meant to deny the old man in its reality. Do you understand? Jesus says, I come with a sword and I come to bring division. Do you understand what that says? He's the, what's being divided it's being divided from the old man and the new man. The old man's going to be against the new man. They're not going to, they're going to, there's going to be enmity there. The old man's way of thinking is always going to be against that. Whether it's family, it's friends, it's whoever it is, there's always going to be an enmity. Why? It's because Jesus is the sword. Unless that sword pierces your spirit, soul, and body, and you become born again, and you identify yourself, spirit, soul, and body, completely in the spirit of Christ Jesus, you're going to identify yourself to an idol and live in idol worship. This is why people struggle hearing the voice of God. Are you hearing me? I want to take you guys to the next level, okay? So understanding, hearing the voice of God, it comes through scripture. So when you read scripture, don't just read to discover God's nature. It's good to do that, by the way or his character, it's good to do that, by the way. But I wanna challenge you to add into that. Read his word to learn his voice. When you learn his voice, it'll be easy to recognize the voice you've always been hearing. When you understand that God has given you the desire of your heart, you're gonna start trusting the desire of your heart as God's voice. You're gonna perceive the desire of your heart as God's voice. You're going to perceive your inspirations as the voice of God. 
Well, Polly B, how can you tell people to do that? You know, there's people that live in wickedness. There's people that live in sin. You can't tell people to do that because people live in wickedness. The fact that you can recognize that should prove to you you're more mature than you're giving yourself credit for. The devil just twisted us with these fancy little carnal words that come in and twisted up the truth by making you think because you have a bad thought that God isn't going to move or work or do anything in you. Do you understand that Jesus even had carnal thoughts? I'm not saying Jesus was carnally minded. Don't misunderstand. Don't twist what I'm saying. Okay? I'm not saying he was carnally minded, but he definitely had a carnal thoughts. He sympathizes with us in our weakness. He understood. I can prove it to you in Scripture. It tells us he had a carnal thought. It proves it to us in Scripture. Many places, but I'll show you one just for the sake of time. Do you understand when Jesus was about to die on the cross? He said this, Not my will be done, but your will be done. Okay, listen, listen. Not my will be done, but your will be done. How many wills is he talking about here? Not my will be done, your will be done. This is the Savior of the world. This is the one that we teach. He only had one will, God's will. Why is Jesus talking out of two wills here? Because he had a will that had to submit to God's will and understand there was no will outside of God. And any will that you think you have outside of God is a carnal mind. You have to ask who the who is. That's telling you, you can have another will outside of God. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying who's the who telling you you can. If you can discern that, you're probably more mature than you're giving yourself credit for. And you probably hear God way better than you thought you have. See, I'm here to prove to you how you've always been hearing the voice of God. You've been, one, hearing him through the word. Two, you've been hearing him through your inspirations. Three, you've been hearing him through your desires. But nobody's taught us how to do that. Nobody sat down and walked us through scripture and taught us to walk through the processing of this. Understanding like you don't have to identify yourself by your last mistake. You can actually identify yourself by Jesus. The voice of God it says the voice of God never heard it. Uh, and that's, and you know what? You're not alone. Probably about 99% of everybody has it, including the people in the Bible. Because the word of God is perceived, not heard. I'm not saying God can't talk audibly. I'm not saying he won't. But about 99.9% .9 of the time in the Bible, the words of God were perceived. I can show you like countless, an unlimited amount of scriptures. For an example, Moses, Exodus 33, 11, he looks at the burning bush and he perceived it as being the voice of God. Not only the voice of God, he perceived it as the face of God and said he spoke face to face with God. Do you know in scripture it says no man has seen God and lived. But to Moses, when he seen the burning bush and he heard the voice, perceiving the voice that was coming from the bush as God, it was perceiving it. And he perceived it literally as seeing God face to face. So you're not alone. Just want you to know that. The voice of, you have to understand this. The voice of God is perceived more than it is heard. Way more than it is ever heard. Rarely do you ever see anywhere, including in the Bible, where you see a literal audible voice being spoken. It's been perceived. It was perceived as something. What do you see? Look at Jeremiah, look at that pot. You see the pot of water? What do you perceive? What do you see? He's asking him, whatever he sees is the voice of God. He's, whatever he perceives is what the voice of God is speaking. See, people don't understand this because they're ignorant. They haven't been taught the word of God. Like, right? They're, they don't understand spiritual things. They're still carnal. And this is why we got to understand that we're dead to the carnal mind. We're dead to that. We're dead to the, the, the thing. That, see, when I'm talking here and people don't understand and you say that's foolishness, it's because you're still thinking carnal. That's a sign. That, that tells you the voice you're listening to. It's a stranger's voice. Right? This is where we got to repent and believe. And we got to understand there's spiritual ways to understanding things here. Okay? So, when we understand that all scripture is inspired, then that inspiration is the literal voice of God. So that means your inspiration is the voice of God speaking to you. All scripture is inspired. 
of God. <laughs> Listen, who's the king of kings? Type in the comments. Who's the king of kings? Who's the Lord of lords? Who's the king of kings? Who's the Lord of lords? Who created all things? All things were created for him, through him, and by him. Right? Who created all things? Process this for a second, okay? Who's the who here? Jesus. So Jesus created all things, and all things were created in him, and by him, and for him. And you understand he's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. Is it too far-fetched to think he's the word of words? Where do you think language came from? Where do you think words came from? Can I teach you something spiritual? I know, I know what I'm speaking to this. I'm speaking to an open crowd. A lot of people aren't ready for what I'm sh sharing. And I get that, especially online. There's a lot of people that aren't ready for this. And I get it. I understand. You can tell by their comments. They're not ready. <clears throat> but I want you to perceive something here. It's super important you understand this, okay? When it comes to hearing the voice of God, when it comes to knowing the voice of God, when it comes to living in the realities of God, you have to understand how God speaks and thinks. And you have to understand you were created in that image and likeness. For an example here, when God said, let there be light, here's the question I have for you. Who was there listening? Listen, who was there listening? Beside, okay, let me, let me rephrase my question. When God said, when the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together said, let there be light. When God said, let there be light. When the Trinity said, let there be light. Who was there to hear it? Who was there to hear it? But you know that everything responded to it. All of creation responded to it. Nobody was created yet, so nobody was there to hear it. My question here is, what language did they speak? What language did they speak? And who was there to hear it? Did they speak Hebrew, Aramaic, English, Spanish, Swahili? Process this for a second. What language did they speak? Now, can I teach you something spiritual for a second? God isn't bound by our words. God allowed us the freedom and gave us the ability to speak words and, 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 and to conversate with one another through words. He gave us that ability. It come from Him. Because He is the Word. Okay? And the Word creates. The Word has power. Okay? So you have to understand what I'm saying here. So if the word has power, the word creates, and you're born of this word, and you speak this word, and you live in this word, and this word becomes an inhabitation to you, that means you respond to it. When, when the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit spoke to creation, they said, let there be light, there was nobody created, but yet everything responded to it. There was nothing was created and there was no in particular language, then it's not about a certain language that gets results. It's not about certain words that gets results. I'm talking spiritually here. I know that's beyond our carnal thinking. But I want you to understand spiritual things here. See, what we'll do is we'll get caught up with what language, what word. There was no word. It was this, it was that. Listen. It was a vibration. It was a feeling. It was this. They'll go down through a whole list of things that it was. Listen, and I'm not saying you're wrong, by the way. I'm just saying everything that you mentioned, Jesus created, and Jesus is the reference point to it. And because Jesus created it, and because Jesus is the reference point, everything responds to it. I want you to understand the power of the word. 
If you don't know the power of the word, you're going to get tricked into any word. If you're trying to divide the word by that's a carnal word and that's a spiritual word, you've taken the word and you dumbed it down. Technically, all words God has a definition for. This is why he says, take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ, because your thoughts are words. Your thought is as good as a word. It's as good as speaking. Your thought is as good as you speaking. Your thought is a word. So maybe God thought it and it was a word. I don't know. It could have been any one of those. However you want to dice that up and put it out, Jesus is the reference point. So what's the point here? The point is this, that we don't get lost in the sauce of carnal words. We understand the reference point, that Jesus is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and the Word of Words. When you understand that, you have the ability to take any carnal word, good, bad, and ugly, and you take him captive to the obedience of Christ and you say, Lord, what do you see about that? What do you hear about that? What would you speak about that? Do you understand the devil creates nothing? The devil can create nothing. Nothing. And anything he creates, he uses God's creation to manipulate it, to use against you, to make you believe he can create. The devil can create nothing. So do you, do you want, I want you to capture the essence of the words you're speaking. My point is here, it's not about you having all the right magical words or having the, the right formula to the right word to be able to see somebody miraculously healed or the right word, the magical word that's just perfect, that's just gonna make the right prophetic words. Listen, it's not about that. It's just simply about understanding Jesus is the reference point to the word. You release the word and the word will go forth and it will not come back void because it's the word. And what it's sent forth to do, it will accomplish and everything will respond to it. That's the kind of faith you take on as a son and daughter of God when you release the prophetic word. Are you guys okay? Does this make sense? Okay? So I want you to understand this. I, Rizzo, do you understand why I'm telling you that? I'm telling you that so we don't complicate this thing. I want this thing to be just knucklehead, stupid, simple. Like, right? And, 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 I, and no pun intended when I say that. I'm just, you know, I just want this thing to be simple, man. Like, don't, don't make this such a rocket science that you create a false fear in you that's scared to speak a word. Do you understand something about words? Do you understand about words? Do you understand? In scripture it says that, that prophecy and tongues work hand in hand. Okay? When you speak in a tongue, you're to prophesy. Right? They work hand in hand. Tongues can ignite prophecy. Do you understand the words that come out in tongues? They're an unknown tongue. So prophecy makes the unknown known, right? That's what it does. It brings the heart of God. Do you understand that it says this? It's tongues and interpretation. Everybody write interpretation in the comments. It's tongues and interpretation. Write interpretation in the comments. If you guys are enjoying this, why do we only have eight shares? You guys not enjoying this? Are you kidding me? Is this not that good? Eight shares? Wow. Okay. That's weird. <clears throat> only eight? <laughs> Come on, if you're enjoying this, let's share this. Share it three, four, or five people, guys. I want to teach you something here. Okay? We have a hundred people and it should be easy a hundred shares there. It says tongues and interpretation. Everybody write interpretation in the comments. Do you understand that it does not say, what does it not say? It does not say tongues in translation. Does it say in scripture that it's tongues in translation? Or does it say tongues in interpretation? Which one does it say? Tongues in translation or tongues in interpretation? 
Because if it's tongues in translation, that means that every word that comes out of your mouth needs to be identical to a T. Every T crossed, every I merged, you know, dot period in the right spot, every comma in the right spot, like everything's gotta be perfect. Just the way God said it. Do you understand? The Bible doesn't teach us that. It says tongues and interpretation. So what does that mean? Do you understand that God is not lost in the sauce? <laughs> he's not lost in his word. He's found in it. Just let that soak. He's not lost in his word. He's found in it. He's not lost in distinction. Do you understand? You have a thumbprint. Your thumbprint is a unique. There's only one of them in the whole world. Do you understand your uniqueness makes you distinct from anyone else? This is how in the carnal world they can tell who you are. But do, do you understand that God don't need to know this to tell who you are? Because he's not lost in distinction, he's found in distinction. Did you just get what I just said? God is not lost in distinction. He's found in distinction. He's not lost in dualism. He's found in it. This is the point. This is why I'm teaching you this because I want you to learn how to hear the voice of God. And I want you to be accurate. And I want you to have confidence so that you don't fearful to sharing what's in your heart. Most people fear to give a word because they want everything to be to a T, exactly the way God would say it, or they don't say nothing at all because they think they're a false prophet. That person is very, does not understand spiritual things. And that's why I'm teaching you this to make it simple for you guys. The Bible does not say that it's tongues in translation. Translation means it got to be exactly to a T. Interpretation means according to you, your identity, your uniqueness, you can look at something and it means something unique to you. For an example, we can look at my wife and I on our wedding day. Let's just use this as an example, okay? Here's a picture of my wife and I on our wedding day. Now, if I was to ask you, when you look at this picture, what is the very first thought that comes to your mind? Not the second, not the third, but the very first thought that comes to your mind when you look at that picture. Type in the comments. What's the very first thought that comes to your mind when you look at this picture of me and my wife on our wedding day? Happiness, beautiful, a happy couple, love, wedding, kindness, race, purple, love, love, happy couple and blessings, love, young, Racism. Embrace. You don't have to be sorry for saying that. Just think about this for a second, okay? Word. Now listen. Which one of you are wrong and which one of you are right? Which one of you are wrong and which one of you are right? Do you understand that when you look at this picture, you perceive, you're perceiving what this looks like to you. Do you understand what you're telling me? You're giving me your interpretation of what I've just shown you. You are giving me the interpretation of what I've just shown you. Now, let's just use this as an example now. Say you had a thought in your mind. Your thought in your mind creates an image. That image creates a word. That word is listen it's an in, it's inspired by god it's given to you by god you're looking at that image that's in your mind and that word came forth that's your interpretation of what you see in the spirit do you get what i'm saying this is why people are in error when it comes to prophecy. They think it's interpretation, that, 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 that interpretation of tongues. They think that it's tongues and 
interpretation instead of tongues and translation. Do you understand? Every one of you translated to me what that meant to you. Just because you are uniquely different and you use kind and happiness and race and all these other different things, love, beautiful, none of you are wrong. Matter of fact, if you put yourself together in one body and you were speaking, you would be bringing in an awesome word. Like, right? But you gotta learn to trust this. This is the biggest thing is religion will rob you from trusting this. I want to I want to free you from from what religion has bound you to. And I'm not meaning that like I'm poking at Christianity because I'm not. And I'm not saying Christianity is false and wrong and teaching wrong. No, no, don't forbid that. Forbid not. I'm not saying that. I love community. I love my brothers and sisters. I love it. But there are some thought processes that have been in error that have kept you bound from being free. Now, if you take this and you can trust the Holy Spirit enough, if you can have enough faith to believe and learn to train your mind in the spirit, everybody say spirit, in the spirit of your mind, you train your mind that you can read the words in scripture and understand these words are tra translated by another man who was inspired by God that gave you these words. The Bible's words are only here because another man written down his inspirations and he said it was inspired by God and we believe it as God's word. But you won't believe that your translation or interpretation, excuse me, your interpretation is of God and inspired by God. Who's the who telling us this? Like, right? It's, it, it isn't connected. It isn't made sense. Do you guys see how this can be easy now? So what am I teaching you? I'm teaching you, first of all, is you need to go to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, help me to train my mind in the Spirit to identify my mind, not as a carnal mind, but as a mind of Christ. That my thoughts that come, I identify as thoughts that come from you. The fact that I can recognize a thought isn't of you shows how mature I am, not what's wrong with me. I hope somebody's hearing me, boy. Lord, please, don't let this, let this go on good soil. Don't let this go into a vain imagination, Lord. In Jesus' name. <clears throat> awesome, Christy. Donnie, bless you. How can you be for sure it's God? How can you be for, let me ask you this, Bobby. How can you be for sure it's God? The same way you're for sure that you're born again. How can you be for sure you're born again? How are you for sure you're born again? The same faith it takes to be born again is the same faith it takes to believe that you're hearing from God. Do you know how you know it's from God? It's because you have relationship with God. Those who use and exercise the Spirit of God the most never ask that question. Those who don't, they ask that question. And I'm not meaning that like I'm throwing punches here because I know that's, I'm not doing that. I'm just making a point that when we're in the Word and we are devout to the Word, we know what the Word sounds like. When we're engaging and talking to the Holy Spirit all the time, when we're learning, this is why I don't teach you to go out and prophesy to everybody else. I teach you to be your own prophet, priest, and king. When you learn how to control your own emotions and mind, thoughts, feelings, when you learn how to hear God for yourself in your own life, this will bring confidence. It's through use and exercise do you train your senses how to be confident in what's of God and what's not. If a person is not for sure, if it's God speaking or them speaking, they don't know, first of all, who they are, and they have not trained themselves. That's, that's the first thing. You, they have not trained themselves. They have not trained their senses. Or they've not known how to train their senses. Or they've been taught a weird belief system that's made them question their senses. Like it's, what, it's something in there that's not meat in the eye is what I'm trying to say, right? So at the end of the day, what I'm teaching you guys is trust God. The same faith 
it takes to believe for your salvation is the same faith it takes to believe for a healing. Same faith it takes to believe that you're hearing God's voice and you only know it by use and exercise. The only way you're confident in your salvation is if you have relationship with the Lord. It's only those who do not have relationship with God or a good relationship with God that question their salvation. Does that make sense? So listen, guys, I'm going to continue this series with you guys. I gave you guys in the first part one, I gave you 20 different ways that we hear God. Today is part two, and we hit one of the 20. And I'm going to go down through each one, and I want to teach you them, okay? Not all today. But today we're talking about perceiving God's voice through Scripture. So this is going to be a whole series, okay? You can catch the replay on YouTube of the last one I did. This is part two. I'm teaching you how to perceive God through scripture. We're gonna come back and I wanna teach you how to perceive God through prayer on the next one, okay? Then dreams, then visions, then through prophetic words, then through nature. We're gonna go right down this list. By the time we're done with this 20, you guys are gonna be professionals. You guys, all, the only thing that's gonna be missing and lacking, if anything, is use and exercise. I promise you this. Those who use and exercise the Spirit of God the most will see the most. Those who don't will question God the most and will not see hardly anything. And that person shouldn't see anything. Why? Is because they don't believe, right? They're in a double mind. And a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways and wondering why his prayers aren't being answered, why God isn't hearing him, why God is mad at him, why God is... They don't know God. If they're talking like that, they don't know God. Anybody that talks like that, I understand the pain. Trust me, I've done it. I've been guilty of it. I know. So don't, don't think like I haven't done it or I haven't done it, you know, even as of recently, I've done it once in a while. I've got a little man like, whoa, whoa, wait, where are you at? Like, and I had to stop. Like, wait, I repent. Let me take that thought captive. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you think about that? What do you see? I have to do it too, guys. Like, right? I'm human like any one of you. I got to exercise this. But when we recognize this, the fact that you can recognize it shows how mature you are. It shows you have discernment of spirit. It shows that you know the word better than you're probably giving yourself credit for. Woo. That's right. The Holy Spirit's our helper. He searches the deep things of God. Right? It's all done in the spirit. Amen? It's all done in the spirit. Amen? Amen? You guys know that, right? It's all done in the spirit. Everything's done in the spirit. Amen. Let me show you one last scripture real quick on what we're talking about the spirit here. I think it's 1 Corinthians, if I'm not mistaken. Excuse me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Type 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay. And I'm going to read through 19 through 14, okay? I'm going to try not to take too awful long because I've been on here a long time. <clears throat> but you made a great comment, sis, that it's the Spirit who leads us. This is why I want to teach you spiritual things. I want to teach you to take everything to Holy Spirit. I want to teach you to trust Jesus. I'm not going to teach you carnal, dead old man rea realities. I'm not going to teach you to question yourself, second guess yourself. I'm not going to teach you dead old man carnal gospel and thought processes. I'm only going to teach you God's mind, right? God's mind. That's it. So here we go. Verse 10. But God has revealed, everybody type revealed, them to us through his what? Spirit. For the Spirit searches, everybody say searches in the comments, all things. The Spirit searches how many things? How many things? How much does the Spirit search? We gotta get convinced here. We have to believe in what we know. He searches how many things? He searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Now listen to me. Do you understand when God says, 
that man's ways are not my ways. Man's thoughts are not my thoughts. God's thoughts are higher than man's thoughts. God's ways are higher than man's ways. You understand that, right? We understand that. And yes, it's Captain Obvious, I don't think I have to say this to anybody, that we understand to try to wrap our mind around God. Good luck with that, like, right? But, stop. Let's not use that as excuse. Let's not get into the old dead man gospel and create a theology in that. Listen to me. Do you understand when he says, my thoughts aren't your thoughts, my ways aren't your ways, he's talking to the dead old man in context? Do you know that? Do you know that? He's speaking to the dead old man. You are a new and living way. You are a life-giving spirit. You are not to identify yourself to the old man whose ways are not God's ways, whose thoughts are not God's thoughts, whose thoughts are far from God. Your thoughts are about God. They're in God. They're by God. They're through God. They're of God. Are you following me? How do you know this? Because you are born again. You are a life-giving spirit. That's what the new man is. The new man is a person who lives and moves and has his being by the spirit of God, not by his soul. The first Adam was controlled by his soul, his mind, will, and inner man. The last Adam controlled his mind, will, and inner man, his soul, by his spirit. He didn't orphanize it. He didn't throw it away. Jesus did not commit mental suicide to himself and try to deny and reject himself. Matter of fact, he said, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And do you understand what he's saying? Unless you partake of my flesh. Do you understand? He didn't, he didn't reject and orphanize his flesh. That's, that's old man jargon. Not new man. You are a new man, a new woman in God. That jargon is prophesying dead old man realities. That's not who you are. But listen to who you are. You are born of the Spirit. So if you're born of the Spirit, understand this. But God has revealed them to us. What has He revealed to us? Write down Colossians 1.16. Go look it up yourself later, okay? If you want to know what He's revealed to us. His Spirit. For the Spirit searches the deep things of God. My question to you is, is who is your teacher? Who is your teacher? Who's your teacher? Who's your teacher? And where does your teacher dwell? In you, right? Who is your teacher? The Holy Spirit, right? So if the Holy Spirit is your teacher, and the Holy Spirit is searching the deep things of God, what is the deep things of God? He's searching the literal mind of God. And he's coming back and teaching you. What is he teaching you? Dead old man realities? That you don't live from here, you only live from here? He ain't teaching you that religious jargon. Anybody that tells you you don't live from here, you live from here, they don't know who they are. They don't know what spirit they're speaking of. Don't mock them, don't beat them, just understand. That's discernment, They, they're, that's immature. They just don't understand. It's not a bad thing. We all been there, we've all done it, I've done it too. Okay? I'm just making a point here to give you discernment so you can discern the word. He, he searches the deep things of God and he comes back and he teaches you the deep things of God, the mind of God. This means this. Yes, it's true, guys. To wrap our minds around the fullness of God, come on, we all know like that's like, what the heck? God's mind is infinite. Like, wow. But listen to me. This is what it means. is because we're in spirit and union with him. When we need something, we can go to the spirit and the spirit talks and communicates and shows us and teaches us. That's the difference between the two. Does this make sense? Okay, here we go. What does he teach us? The deep things of God. For what man knows the things of, of a man? Here it is. What man knows the things of man? Except the spirit of the man, which is in him. Okay? Even, okay, here we go. Even, except the spirit, oh, okay, I, I said that. I, I'm sorry, I got confused there. Even so, no one 
knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. So listen, nobody knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received. Everybody put, we have received. What have we received here? Come on, what have we received? Here it is, here's the good news. Not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit whom is from God that we might know, everybody say no, that you might know, that you have access, that you can know the things of God. It says it right here in your Bible. That have been freely, freely given to us by God. God's mind has been freely given to you to have full access to. So, you should never believe, I can't live from here, I live from here. This dualistic, double-minded thinking is unstable in all your ways, and hey, this will make you wonder why God's not answering your prayers, where he's at, why he's ignoring you, and why breakthrough isn't happening. Because double-mindedness. So when you see that, that's not meant to beat yourself up. That's called discernment. You've been hearing God this whole time. Oh my gosh, you're more... <laughs> You're more mature than you give yourself credit for. Give me a high five. Come on. Process. Verse 13. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. Oh my gosh. Is, are, are they just telling us right here that man's words, listen to me, not what man teaches, but what spirit teaches. What is that telling us? That we should take captive every thought or every word that comes in a form of a thought to the obedience of Christ because God says something about the word that man's speaking. Don't reject the words. Don't, re don't deny them. Take them captive. Don't say, I rebuke that. I don't rebuke that thought. I rebuke that. Word. No, take it captive. Immature people rebuke it. That's how they handle their problems. They just think rebuking them and hiding them and brushing them under the rug is going to fix something. No. You being a mature adult, take, boop, bring it right in. Say, Holy Spirit, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you speak? How do you feel about that? What do you imagine and think about that? You search the deep things of God and get to know God through dialoguing, through contemplation, through engaging. That's why we're going to step in next week into prayer when I talk about this again. Okay? Compare, here it is. Here it is. Which Holy Spirit teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Meaning, spiritual things can only be discerned spiritually. This is why this next verse makes so much sense. But to the natural man, the person who's identifying self to carnality, that's the natural man. That's not you. That's not you. Because you're born again. Unless you're not born again, then you're a natural man. But if you're born again, that's not you. But the natural man does not receive the things of God. He doesn't have the mind of God. He doesn't think like God. His ways aren't God's ways. Because he's a natural man. He's, he's looking at his natural mind. He's rationalizing. And it's nothing, listen to me guys, there's nothing wrong with rationalism. Don't let the enemy trick you here. There's nothing wrong with your mind, your brain, your thoughts. The problem is we haven't given a reference point to them. This is why Ephesians 4.23 tells us, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed. Everybody say be renewed. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Everybody say spirit. That means that the spirit of God is the reference point to your mind. What is your mind? Your thoughts, your ideas, your perspectives, your opinions. Whoa, that's a tough one. Yeah, the, your opinions do matter and account, by the way. I, I don't know who the who's telling you it doesn't. Because if you're in Christ, your opinion does matter, by the way. Like, right? So your opinions do matter. Your ideas, your perspectives, your thoughts, your imagination, all those things matter. Why? It's because now they have a reference point because you're taking them. You're not like the first Adam who lives by their imagination, by their feelings and emotions that lead their spirit. That's, that's, that's the spirit of this world. That's how the spirit of the world functions. The spirit of Christ just does bipolar opposite. 
we take everything that God created in the natural and gave to us as a gift, captive to the obedience of our spirit, filter it through him and only do what our father says and only speak what he says. Does that make sense? That's all we do. It's that simple. Here we go. But the natural man does not perceive the things of God or the spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. Right? They're foolishness. They're foolishness to him. Nor can they know him because they are spiritually discerned. 